So, we have uh, had one session on non silicon based device that is germanium based device. <coughs> so, in this module 4, we continue on the germanium based device MOSFET and take a peep into compound semiconductor materials and devices. So, we had uh, seen what problems are in Mollwood in using germanium for MOS devices. The most important thing that was required there was the surface preparation and what dielectric you will use. Originally, it was uh, believed that the germanium oxide should be completely removed from the surface and then you have to do some passivation techniques like ammonia passivation and possibly deposit high k dielectric. But later on it was clear that it was not the germanium oxide which is giving problem. Germanium oxide indeed would help if you do proper stoichiometric oxide growth good quality germanium oxide and then do some passivation and deposit high k dielectric materials to make a moist devices. In fact, I will show you in today's presentation three case studies or three approaches which have been tried out fairly successfully to realize p channel MOS devices using germanium. P channel is used because in germanium the effort is to realize P channel MOSFET because the whole mobility in germanium is the best as compared to silicon or gallium arsenide or indium phosphide. Okay. So, we will take a look at these three cases. First one is the one that was uh, done in the Stanford with the professor Sarasvath's group germanium mass cap using ozone oxidation which I have discussed last time just I will point out today. All that is ensured there is the complete oxidation of germanium oxide using O 3 that is ozone. Then use hafnium dioxide, hafnium oxide as high dielectric platinum electrode. Second approach is again thermal oxidation this was reported in 2009 we will finish the first one and go to second one germanium MOSFET that was from Singapore in 2009. This involved thermal oxidation of germanium oxide, hafnium oxide, use of fluorine for passivation and tantalum nitride get electrode and uh, forming gas annealing. Okay, we will see the details. Third one is the germanium MOSFET with the Al 2 O 3 germanium oxide and germanium gate. We will see them one by one. This one what we have seen last time itself. Here what we showed was what is shown by Stanford group was that use ozone oxidized germanium freshly cleaned surface oxidize it at different temperatures 200, 350, 400 and 450 and in each case first the what they did was 200, 350 and 400 they did oxidation and deposited low temperature oxide that is LPCVD SiO2 at 300 degree centigrade. So, they found this gave mass capacitors with the DIT which went on reducing as you increase the temperature of oxidation 200 that is the DIT across the band gap from the valence band up right up to mid gap went up to 350 still went down 400 it went down further this red circles. Now, when they went to 450 that became worse telling you that you can do the oxidation of germanium at higher temperature with ozone it gives better results with the hafnium oxide as the high k dielectric, but the result gets the interface state density becomes worse 
you can see it, it goes on reducing then above 450 it increases telling you that germanium oxide begins to decompose at higher temperatures. So, you are restricted to 400 degree centigrade. Now, what they did was okay, choose 400 degree centigrade for germanium oxidation with ozone instead of silicon dioxide use hafnium oxide by atomic layer deposition at 130 degree centigrade that gave them the best interface to density as low as 3 into 10 to power 11 centimeter square per electron volt per centimeter square per electron volt. So, these were uh, by various techniques measured and the lowest interface state density reported in that. Okay. There is no MOS effect by itself reported in that report, subsequently they have reported something, but we will take on some other approach instead of using ozone, the approach done by Singapore that is using germanium MOS device with GO2 <coughs> and high k dielectric hafnium oxide that also atomic layer deposition, but what they used it they use regular thermal oxidation at 400 degree centigrade because it does not decompose at that temperature. So, 2 nanometer of thermally grown germanium oxide was grown and then using atomic layer deposition at 300 degree centigrade hafnium oxide layer of 4.5 nanometer was deposited on the germanium oxide. Okay. Now, once you have this double layer, once you have this double layer of hafnium oxide and germanium oxide on germanium, okay, incorporate fluorine into some samples, because they did various experiments in some of them they incorporated fluorine by CO 4 plasma treatment in inductively coupled plasma chamber IEC ICP with pressure of 100 millitor and a mixed flow of freon and oxygen. That means, you have fluorine passivation taking place at the same, of, same time some amount of oxygen is supplemented to keep the oxidation on okay. and for various duration they did that uh, CFO treatment. Followed doing this they did the post deposition anneal PDA at 500 degree centigrade for 30 seconds for all the samples. So, in some sample they did not do this fluorine treatment, but in some of them they did that followed by the PDA was done all the on all the samples. Then tantalum nitride metal electrode formation for the gate. Finally, they did, they did forming gas anneal FGA at 350 degree centigrade for 1 hour on some of them. So, forming gas is hydrogen plus nitrogen combination. So, you can see that there are double passivations that have been done. One is native germanium oxide is present, hafnium oxide as the gate dielectric. Then you have got the fluorine passivation and then you have got the hydrogen passivation in forming gas. Different combinations have been tried out, here are the results. These are the capacitance voltage characteristics taken on these devices. For example, just only the germanium thermal oxide and hafnium oxide and tantalum nitride and with only P D A. No forming gas annealing, no fluorine passivation. When they did that, this black squares show the frequency the C V characteristics at 1 megahertz and the this upper curve shows the frequency response at 1 kilohertz. So, telling you that there is frequency dispersion of the C V characteristics. When you go to higher frequency, the capacitance falls indicating that there is and when you go to lower frequency, capacitance is higher 
indicating that there is response of the interface states taking place to these frequencies. So, the presence of high frequency is indicated by the frequency dispersion as you already know. Now, the red curves two of them one at 1 megahertz the lower curve the upper curve is at 10 kilohertz. Okay. This is at 10 kilohertz this is at 1 megahertz. So, here again you can see only the the fluorine precipitation was not done only the forming gas annealing was done that means hydrogen precipitation was used using the forming gas the capacitances were higher it showed better results, but still there was frequency response frequency dispersion. There is some stretch out effect still you can see you can see when there is no F G A or fluorine the stretch out is more when you use the uh, forming gas annealing stretch out is reduced. Now, with both fluorine plasma annealing and and forming gas anneal, you can see the stretch out is, is steep, stretch out has disappeared, indicating that the interface stress density is drastically reduced and very little frequency dispersion is seen. So, combined effect of fluorine passivation with the CF4 plasma and hydrogen passivation with the forming gas anneal did the trick for them, really reducing the interface state densities and to get X and C V on the p type substrate. Okay. Uh, I am sorry on the n type substrate because in the n type substrate when you apply minus voltage just one minute this was actually the uh, starting material was if I have uh, n type substrate and I apply plus voltage it is accumulation When I apply negative voltage it is depletion. So, this is the inversion this is the n type substrate p channel device inverted with the p channel. Okay. So, I am sorry I am again making mistake n type substrate inverted p, ch p channel negative voltage holes are attracted to the surface. So, inversion layer is p so, you have got p channel device using n type substrate. Okay. Okay, germanium MOSFET process steps germanium p MOSFET were fabricated using n type germanium as it is a very state that if you want to make p channel device n type substrate must be used. So, that was the MOS cap or the MOSFET were fabricated by using 100 oriented n type germanium wafers, gate dielectrics, germanium oxide 1 nanometer, hafnium oxide 3.5 nanometers layers implanted with boron 10 to the power 15. See, sorry, See, gate oxide is grown by germanium oxidation and of course, your plasma passivation etcetera and hafnium oxide 3.5 nanometers source range was formed by for making a MOSFET by implantation of boron because the p channel MOSFET source is p and range is p. Then plasma passivation was done forming gas healing was done at 350 degree centigrade for 2 hours 350 degree centigrade. Deposit contact material aluminum and pattern. So, now a high drain current of 37.8 micro ampere per micrometer at V g minus V threshold equal to minus 1.2 volts. You can see that the gate voltage is negative and you have positive holes in the channel minus 1.2 volts it gives quite high drain current 37.8 micro ampere micrometer and the interface state density of 2 into 10 to the power of 11 per centimeter square per electron volt. I do not say that it is uh, negligible, but it is very small that is reported and the mobility of 3 96 centimeter square per volt second have been reported for n channel with channel length equal 10 micrometer. Now, we may ask how good is this mobility? This mobility was the at that time it was the best that is reported on germanium. Earlier they got even worse mobility because 
of the high interface state density. Okay. But the ideal mobility that can be achieved for p channel uh, germanium MOSFETs is expected to be 1900 centimeter square per volt second, we are far off still. Okay. So, now these are the characteristics for germanium MOSFET from NUS National University Singapore June 2009 transactions and alternative devices the picture is taken from there 2009. Germanium high K MOSFETs using CF4 plasma treatment germanium oxide plus hafnium oxide dielectric incorporated fluorine and finally, any is forming gas at 350 degree centigrade for 1 hour after the tantalum nitride metallization. Okay. The DIT of 2 into 10 to power 11 per centimeter square per electron volt was observed after hydrogenation. You can see the characteristic here. Without the forming gas annealing, without the uh, fluorine, without the fluorine passivation plasma, the dotted line gives a current for V g minus V threshold equal to minus 1.2 volts. And for the same condition, but with fluorine, if you have done the fluorine passivation, you get much higher current. What was about 30, 32 micro ampere per micrometer went up to about 37, 38 micro ampere per micro micrometer gate width. When you say micro ampere per micrometer, implementation implication is micro ampere per micrometer of channel length, channel width. Okay. So, this tells us that this indeed gives us the impact of fluorine passivation to enhance the current, to enhance the mobility. Okay. We will see the, that subsequently for some time not much improvement has been done, but in the, the latest one February 2012 there was a report in the transactions on the electron devices February 2012 a group from Japan. Okay, they reported the use of instead of hafnium oxide, use L two O three layer as the dielectric. Okay, they did not use straight away the thermal oxidation, but they showed that you can grow germanium oxide in between the L two O three and the germanium. By, by annealing at 300 degree centigrade in a plasma after depositing L2O3. So, the way they did was deposited, but clean the surface of course, that is important. Deposited after cleaning the layer at L2O3 aluminum oxide by atomic layer deposition at 300 degree centigrade using trimethyl aluminum and H 2 O precursor TMA trimethyl aluminum that is the common thing that is used. Okay. And then kept the wafer at 300 degree centigrade subjected the wafer to post plasma oxidation by exposing the L 2 O 3 germanium stack to oxygen state plasma at substrate temperature of 300 degree centigrade. So, what it does is the oxygen from the plasma diffuses into the interface and oxidizes the germanium. That means, you are, you are getting that germanium growing as an intermediate layer and always protected by the by the L 2 O 3 layer. 
So, after this deposition they did the post deposition healing at 400 degree centigrade titanium nitride electrode formation and patterning that makes the moist structure. So, then also that is the structure there where this oxide at the field oxide source drain was implanted by P plus an implantation activation is 400 degree centigrade for very short duration. So, you can see the transistor structure here this is the top view okay, gate source drain that is the nickel gate source and drain nickel gate source and drain contact formation and the back contact aluminum. Okay. We have the source, gate and drain. Gate stack is Al 2 3 germanium oxide dielectric. So, let us see how it worked out. What they saw was they are able to control the thickness of germanium oxide. Vary, you can vary it from 0 to 1.5 nanometers either by fixing the aluminum oxide for a particular thickness say here fix it at 1 nanometer Al 2 O 3. Then subject it to that oxygen plasma okay, at 300 watts you get about 0 0.5 0 0.6 nanometer germanium oxide 500 you get more oxide 650 they get about 1.3 or 1.4 nanometer. Okay. So, if it is 1 nanometer fixed more power you get more oxygen atoms <coughs> diffuse through the Al 2 O 3 layer. Alternately for a given power 300 volts you have to make each for each run you have to make different samples have a thinner aluminum layer. If you have thinner aluminum layer okay, or thicker aluminum layer this is 1 nanometer for the 300 watts if I have 1 na nanometer aluminum layer you get about 0 0.5 nanometer germanium oxide inter intermediate layer. But if I reduce if I increase the L 2 O 3 thickness to 1.6 or 1.5 nanometer you can see the germanium oxide thickness is very small <coughs> much smaller than about 0 0.1 nanometer. So, you can have a perfect control of the germanium oxide thickness either by changing the power RF power of the plasma oxygen plasma or by choosing a different aluminum thickness thinner thickness of aluminum L 2 O 3 more is the thickness of the germanium oxide. Okay. So, you can get good control now what they did they measured made mass cap <coughs> here they have got the mass cap <coughs> they made measurements on that <coughs> and obtain the DIT for different germanium oxide thicknesses by using the approach. Okay. They made gold L 2 O 3 germanium oxide germanium mass caps and measured the interface state density at 0.2 electron volts below the band gap. Okay. Because you can it gives an idea that is the minimum that you get at that location at that point how much is the DIT they got 10 to the power of 12 when the germanium oxide was 0 only L 2 O 3 was present, but it went down to well below about 10 to the power of 11 or so by the time you went to 0 0.5 nanometers 0 0.1 nanometer etcetera you went got even below 10 to the power 11 centimeter square per ultra volt. This was done by element L 2 O 3 of about 1.3 nanometers and 500 watts. So, that tells you that you can get best interface state density by introducing interlayer germanium oxide through the oxidation of the germanium by the oxidation of germanium using plasma oxidation through the Al 2 O 3 layer which is deposited already. Okay. So, that was it also said that there is one to one correspondence between the germanium oxide thickness and DIT 
and germanium oxide thickness controls the d a t very much you should not have you should not have you, if you have very thin layer of germanium oxide you will get or zero we will get high d a t as you keep on increasing germanium oxide say about one nanometer you get very small d a t so about one nanometer of d of germanium oxide is the optimum ok they have not studied the fluorine effect on this but they saw the output characteristics of the p channel MOSFET with l 2 3 germanium oxide g dielectric ok with the uh, with the gold electrode they got very good IV characteristics you can see that V g minus V threshold varied from 0 to minus 0.6 volts very low voltage they got current of 0.4 microampere micrometer and the drain voltage was 0 0.5 volts current is saturating you can see it is saturating here and <coughs> steps of 0 0.1 volts 0 0.1 0 0.2 0 0.3 0 0.4 0 0.5 0 0.6 minus of course current from 0 right up to about 0.4 microampere per micrometer ok. So, this was EOT effective oxide equivalent oxide thickness of 0.98 nanometer W by L equal to 120 micrometer and 50 micrometer, micrometer channel lengths. And they also measured the mobility from this uh, IV characteristics estimated the mobility and they showed that the germanium P MOSFETs exhibit the peak hole mobility values of 515 centimeter square per volt second when the EOT of 1.18 is used there EOT of 1.18 that gives about 515 that is the highest ever reported for germanium P channel MOSFET. And you can see and they used EOT of 466 that was about 1 point uh, I am sorry and the EOT was 1.06 1 1.06 1 that was about 466 mobility and when reduced to 0.98 that turned out to be 400. So, as predicted here ok thicker the germ EOT you get smaller the DAT and thicker the EOT higher the mobility. So, the mobility announcement is correlated with the interface state density that is the implication of that. Obviously, the moment you have the interface state density when you try to invert it and when you change the gate voltage the, the channel charge would change if the interface state density is 0 channel charge would change correspondingly, but if the interface state density state density is present the that will respond to the change in the gate voltage therefore, the channel charge would not change correspondingly as a result the drain current change will not be that much. So, the transconductance will be smaller. So, it is important to have the interface state density reduced drastically. So, this tells you that there is still some interface state density present there <coughs> there is still lot of scope to go ahead with that ok. Now, now, you can see that in all these cases it has been this uh, this is summary of the references that you have chosen before a close count on discussion of germanium 2012, 2009, 2008 starting from the entire millennium lot of effort has gone on on germanium transistors ok. <coughs> there is still long way to go and people have not been looking into n channel MOSFET because that is not a not an issue because you can get uh, we can somehow you know you are concerned about realizing p channel MOSFETs with high hole mobility. So, one can think of combination of silicon and germanium silicon germanium devices or silicon n channel MOSFET, p channel germanium MOSFET, 
combination of those things to make maximus. All sorts of combination can be are uh, foreseen or uh, looked into vigorously by various industry people. So, one can move from here on not only silicon, but uh, not only silicon or germanium which are the same which are the elemental semiconductors one can take a look at look at compound semiconductors like silicon germanium for example it's a compound semiconductor you can look at that is a silicon is fourth group germanium is fourth group so silicon germanium is fourth four 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 group both elements are from fourth group but it's a compound you can mix silicon and germanium in, a, in any composition to you can change the band gap from germanium to silicon. Germanium is 0.66, silicon is 1.1 electron volt at room temperature. Now, you can make an alloy of silicon germanium have a band gap of your choice, have a mobility of your choice. When you mix no doubt you get the benefit of better band gap with the, when you add silicon to germanium, but you lose the benefit of higher mobility. So, you may have to hit a compromise there if you are using silicon germanium. Okay. On the other hand, you can think of germanium which is strained so that a thin layer of germanium so that you can improve the band gap still have high mobility. These are some of the issues with which you can look into. So, if you are thinking of look, looking into compound semiconductors, now you can see already in silicon you are looking at high K. So, in compound semiconductor, in germanium, in all these devices, you are looking to high K dielectrics. More and more high K dielectrics like hafnium oxide or Al2O3 by atomic layer deposition are being vigorously tried out in all approaches. <coughs> now, let us switch gears, therefore, take a look at into the move on into the world of compound semiconductors and the heterostructure FETs. So, what we see here will be today quickly take a look at compound semi what are the materials and what are their properties. Then take a look at MOSFET very briefly then go to high electron mobility transistors and compound semiconductor FETs in the context of channel quantization. If possible, I can also look into we can also look into heterojunction by power transistor. Heterostructures MOSFETs exploiting novel materials train quantization. Okay. Now, as I already mentioned, compound semiconductors can be binary. Binary means there are two compounds, ternary means three compounds, quaternary means four compounds. So, you can have combinations. So, binary <coughs> you can have elements from second group and sixth group, they are called two six compounds elements from third group and fifth group they are called 3 5 compounds. Here for example, cadmium sulphide second group and sixth group here gallium and arsenic gallium arsenide first group uh, third group and fifth group 4 4 silicon and germanium that is 4 4 compounds or silicon and carbon silicon carbide. Okay. These are binary compounds. <coughs> Let us take a look at the 2 6 what are they compounds formed by second group and sixth group second group zinc and cadmium they, these are the materials which have been tried out zinc these numbers are inside I have given you atomic number just for some guideline because general it has some implications I will come back to that later. Zinc and cadmium, 
can form compounds with sulfur, selenium or tellurium from the sixth group. You can have zinc sulfide, zinc selenide, zinc telluride. So, you can see three compounds then cadmium sulfide, cadmium selenide, cadmium telluride. Okay. These are all high atomic number materials. Mostly when they are high atomic materials, they turn out to be direct band gap semiconductors. What are the implications? We will see later. They are direct band gap. <coughs> okay. Means, the momentum of electrons at the conduction bandage and at the valence bandage are same, <coughs> are equal. There can be transition from conduction band to the valence band, electron transition from conduction band to valence band. Similarly, transition from valence bandage to conduction bandage by the help of photons. That is only energy conservation required for transition. So, directly it can transfer, transition can take place with exchange of energy with photons. They are called direct band gap semiconductors. Okay. Now, two six compounds I already mentioned zinc sulfide, zinc selenide, zinc telluride, cadmium sulfide, cadmium selenide, cadmium telluride. <laughs> All of them exhibit direct band gap because of their nature of heavy atoms. <coughs> Without getting into the physics of that, the high atomic number elements when they form compounds, usually, usually they turn out to be direct band gap. That is an observation, that is all. All of them have E g higher than E g of silicon, all these compounds, but all of them have mobility lower than that of silicon, electron mobility. So, normally you would not like to take a look at them for microelectronics or nanoelectronics because of this problem. Okay. Still, it can be useful for optoelectronic applications. 3 5 compounds. <coughs> As I pointed out, elements from the third group, uh, these compounds are formed by third group and fifth group elements. They are compounds. Some people call it as alloys also, but correct term is to call it as compound. Third group, what are the elements? Valence electrons are three in them: aluminum, gallium, indium. Atomic number 13, 31, 49. Fifth group elements phosphorus, arsenic, antimony, nitrogen. You can see that these are all fairly high, high atomic number. Okay. Phosphorus is lower atomic number. So, gallium phosphide forms in indirect band gap. Gallium arsenide direct band gap, gallium antimony direct, gallium nitride direct band gap. These are direct, this is indirect. Indium higher atomic number, it forms direct band gap on all of them. Okay. Aluminum forms Direct band gap, indirect band gap, most of them. Okay, because it's low atomic number or light material, light atom. That's an observation. Okay. <coughs> so to sum up, aluminum, phosphide, aluminum arsenide, aluminum antimonide, eliminated all indirect band gap because of low atomic number associated with aluminum. Gallium phosphide is indirect because phosphorus is lighter. Or gallium arsenide, gallium antimonide, gallium nitride are all direct. Indium phosphide, indium is heavy element, all of them are direct. 
indium phosphide, indium arsenide, indium antimonide, indium nitride all are direct. And I have circled these three materials gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, indium phosphide they all have mobility and band gap greater than that of silicon <coughs> electron mobility we are not talking of hole mobility because none of them have hole mobility better than that of silicon that only germanium can save us ok. So, in case one had to really have high hole mobility one had to look into the ways of introducing germanium also into the galaxy of the semiconductors. So, I is indirect here, D is direct band gap. Okay. Now, these are binary compounds 2 6 3 5 binary giving a pointer towards gallium arsenide indium phosphide. Lot of effort has gone into gallium arsenide and indium phosphide material and devices in the 1990s and 1980s and 90s. Still, there is work going on in that they are being used in the as hetero junctions rather than MOS cap. <coughs> okay. The compound semiconductor people have found a way out to sort out the prob problem of the high interface state density using heterostructure. Okay. So, this is the famous graph which gives you electron mobility at 300 Kelvin on the y axis 100,000, 10,000 etcetera and on the x axis the band gap minimum band gap meaning actually energy band gap actually because there are different band gaps, but the minimum band gap is at the actual band gap. So, band gap is given on the x axis because we are looking at an alternate for silicon. So, material that we look forward to must have if possible better band gap than silicon that means, to the right hand side of this graph okay, that is better band gap and to the upper half of above this line horizontal line that is higher mobility. Take a look at indium antimonide what a mobility it has got 100,000 centimeter square per volt second, but you can see the band gap something like about 0.1 or 0.11 electron volts absolutely no way of using it more microelectronics. What about indium arsenide 20,000 centimeters square per volt second, but you can see the band gap is very very small something like 0.3 or 0.4 electron volts no way you can use it, but take a look at gallium antimonide that has got better mobility but the band gap is also lower than that of silicon. One can think of doing that we provided the whole mobility there is better, but actually the whole mobility there is not good enough I do not have the plot here right now I can bring it to some other time. Germanium you see its band gap is lower compared to that of silicon we already know, but mobility is better. In fact, it has got better whole mobility. That is why I just circled those two. Take gallium arsenide, higher mobility, higher band gap. Indium phosphide, higher mobility, higher band gap compared to silicon. Those are the materials to look forward to. Now, you can think of making, uh, there is one more material, gallium nitride, which has come up in the past uh, decade. It has cat caught up like anything everywhere there is effort to push gallium nitride. The best mobility that is the predicted is about 2000 centimeter square per volt second fine, but look at the band gap something like 3.3 .3 electron volts it can be used for high power high frequency etcetera. In fact, when you go around you will see that 
the saturation velocities of electrons are very very high here. If I am looking into high field operations that will be the material one can look into compared to any other material, but it is a very difficult material to work on very costly material right now. I am sure this is problem where will be sorted out there is a lot of effort going in this direction. So, now let us take a look at this particular thing again once again here. <coughs> I can have a combination of gallium arsenide and indium arsenide. Okay? The gallium arsenide has got higher band gap than that of silicon, indium arsenide has got much higher electron mobility. I mix them together. I can that is I can I can replace some of the gallium atoms with the indium atoms I get gallium indium arsenide that is ternary three elements forming the compound gallium indium arsenide that will have band gap varying linearly from here to there that will be low band gap here but you can still have a band gap with close to silicon and you can still have much higher mobility compared to that of silicon. Okay. So, one can think of or one is thinking of combinations of binary compounds to realize ternaries. Okay. <coughs> Let us see further 4 4 compounds oh we are looking into 3 5 etcetera what are the 4 4 compounds? Silicon, carbon, germanium, silicon, germanium, silicon carbide, silicon is indium uh, indirect band gap, germanium is indirect band gap. So, silicon carbide, silicon germanium both are indirect band gap semiconductors and your band gap will be somewhere in between the two. Silicon carbide of course, has got much higher band gap about 3.3 electron volts. So, this silicon carbide is a material which uh, which has drawn attention of <coughs> people working on high power devices because of wide band gap. Similarly, gallium nitride has drawn the attention of people who work on high power high frequency devices micro devices. Now, Silicon carbide 3.26 electron volt is a band gap higher than that of silicon fine mobility is very poor even half half of that of silicon less than that of silicon electron mobility is silicon, but it will have high field velocity of the velocity of electrons will be high at high fields that we will see later. Properties of elemental and 3 5 semiconductor suitable for microelectronics. So, therefore, summing up, okay. some other properties silicon, gallium arsenide, indium phosphate, germanium, these are the three potential candidates. Band gap, I have already mentioned, they have better band gap. Electromobility, best in gallium arsenide. And indium phosphate, but germanium is nowhere inferior, higher than silicon. Whole mobility silicon 450, gallium arsenide 400, indium phosphate 150, both are poor, no hope for CMOS there. Germanium 1900 efforts are being tried to improve this mobility in germanium. Saturated electron velocity, you may recall that as you keep on increasing the electric field and keep on measuring the velocity of carriers, it keeps on increasing linearly initially, then finally it saturates at a, at a particular value of about 10 to the power of 7 centimeter per second. That is called saturated electron velocity. That is 1, 1.3 into 10 to the power of 7, almost same, nothing much to boast of in any case. Okay. <coughs> Breakdown strength. Silicon about 0.2 to 0.3 mega volts per centimeter, that is 20 volts per micrometer to 30 volts per micrometer, 
depending upon the doping level in junctions and gallium arsenide is slightly better 40 volts per micron indium phosphide about 0.5 volts per micron germanium is poor. So, if you are thinking of 5 voltage device so germanium is not the device then you may have to go back to silicon or some of these materials or some combinations. Okay. But for nano devices when you took a talk of low voltage that is not a constraint. <laughs> Semiconductor other property one looks forward to thermal conductivity watts per centimeter degree Kelvin. You can see among all of them silicon has the best thermal conductivity. You would be concerned about this when you want pack more and more, more devices because the device temperature goes up the chip temperature goes up if the thermal conductivity is high the heat can be taken away by the thermal conduction into the package outside. So, silicon is that way it is better thermal resistance will be smaller ok. Like electrical resistance you can talk of thermal resistance ok. Electrical resistance is lower if the conduct thermal uh, if the electrical conductivity is higher thermal resistance is lower if thermal conductivity is higher. So, that is best in silicon see other material they are all not as good. Relative dielectric constant not of great importance, but almost all of them are there their main is one having higher. This is just now what I mentioned ternary compounds gallium indium arsenide you are denoted by the symbol gallium x indium 1 minus x arsenic 1. Usually when you say stoichiometric gallium arsenide there x is equal to 0 x I am sorry x equal to 1 x equal to 1 indicates indium is 0 and gallium is 1. So, gallium 1 arsenic 1 that is stoichiometric gallium arsenide in the crystal <coughs> for each one gallium atom there is one arsenic atom. Now, if x is equal to 0 0.5 gallium is 0 0.5 indium is 1 minus 0 0.5 that is 0 0.5 arsenic is 1 that means for if there are 10 arsenic atoms there are 5 indium atoms and 5 gallium atoms if x is equal to 0.3 for 10 arsenic atoms there are 3 gallium atoms there are 7 indium atoms the meaning of that that is ternary compound found by allowing indium gallium and arsenic x is the gallium mole mole fraction I what I explained just now x equal to 1 gives gallium arsenide x equal to 0 gives indium arsenide indium arsenide indium arsenide Ternary compound other example is very popular material L gas. The gallium arsenide if you do not have time to say gallium arsenide you can say gas. Aluminum gallium arsenide if you are tired L gas x equal to 1 gives aluminum arsenide x equal to 0 gives gallium arsenide. So, as x is varied from 0 to 1 you get gallium arsenide to aluminum arsenide. You can get uh, this uh, compound ternary compounds. There are spe specific reasons for taking a look at specifically these two ternary compounds because after all if I want to make a heterostructure what is the meaning of heterostructure? Grow different type of materials one over the other make devices using for example, gallium arsenide on the top of that put another material like aluminum gallium arsenide, indium phosphide on the top of that deposit another material like gallium indium arsenide. So, these are that is why these are looked into why this graph plot is a famous plot right from 1980s people have been flashing this let me also flash it to you. When I want to grow or when I want to realize a heterostructure I must be able to grow 
one material over the other material if possible without any strain. That means, the next layer that I deposit on the top must have similar lattice arrangement or similar lattice constant. So, what this gives is the energy band gap of different material on the y axis and on the x axis the lattice constant. T for example, germanium has got lattice constant of 5.65 angstroms that is 0.565 nanometers. Okay. Take a look at gallium arsenide. The germanium band gap is 0.66, that is constant is 0.65, gallium arsenide look at the arrow here 1.43 band gap. See the lattice constant same as that of germanium. So, I can draw a vertical line here 5.65. So, that means one can grow gallium arsenide on germanium without having any lattice dislocations, without having any defects introduced, we can grow gallium arsenide on germanium. In fact, this had prompted to people to grow thin film gallium arsenide on germanium to make solar cells. Okay. Now, you can see I want to make gallium arsenide and germanium heterostructure I can make. I can if I want to make gallium arsenide or if I want to grow aluminum arsenide on gallium arsenide I can go because you can see the lattice constant of aluminum arsenide, gallium arsenide, germanium are almost same they are not exactly matching, but close. So, aluminum arsenide is a band gap which is more about 2.2 electron volts. Now, if I have in between I mix gallium arsenide and aluminum arsenide I get L gas. So, I can vary the band gap from 1.43 to 2.2, but notice remember that aluminum arsenide is a indirect band gas semiconductor. Okay. The dotted lines tell you that they are the indirect band indirect and gallium arsenide is direct. So, if I go from gallium arsenide to aluminum arsenide what you will get will be direct band gap aluminum gallium arsenide ultimately it will be indirect band gap. So, you can grow L gas on gallium arsenide to realize heterostructures. Okay. So, this is shown to the possibility of realizing heterostructure devices L gas on gas, gallium arsenide on germanium or <coughs> why did I talk of gallium indium arsenide? So, this is indium arsenide that is constant is something like 6.1 close to 6.1 and the band gap is very small. I mix gallium arsenide and indium arsenide take about 0.53 of indium I get indium gallium arsenide here band gap is something like 0.7 electron volts and that is constant is matched to that of indium phosphide that is 5.5678 about, about that 5.85 or so you get that. So, you can grow indium gallium arsenide and indium phosphide. So, I just want to point out that I will come back to this particular slide again there is there are varieties of possibilities the sky is limit for choosing the comp compound material when you use compound semiconductors, binary, ternary, quaternary, 4-4 semiconductor, everything you can do that. Thank you very much. We will see in the next lecture of this thing.